right, we're going to get going. We'll let it last a couple more people sit down. Good morning, everyone. I am Margaret Anderson, and I am the executive director of Faster Cures. We're a center of the Milken Institute, and we welcome all of you here to this panel this morning. Um, we are going to be talking about the role of medical research, science funding, um, funding medical breakthroughs and enriching society. And we have a fantastic panel this morning uh, who was going to be talking about all of the different sectors involved in medical research and the different vantage points that they have from those sectors. So to my uh, immediate left is Sir Mark Walport, who's the chief scientific advisor uh, for the UK government and previously with the Wellcome Trust. Then we have um, Gary Nabel, and Gary is the Chief Scientific Officer and Senior Vice President at Sanofi, and he was previously with the National Institutes of Health uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, and he's going to be our resident expert on uh, all things government and what happens when you have a government shutdown, uh, which is why you don't see the next panelist, which is uh, Commissioner Margaret Hamburg. She is the Commissioner of the United States Food and Drug Administration, and due to a government shutdown uh, in the US, she was unable to get on a flight and come here last night, so she will not be joining us today. Um, but then we have uh, Rexandra Dragia Akli. Did I say that correctly? Yes. She is the director uh, of the Research Innovation Center in the European Commission. And then Tim Peekman, who's the deputy CEO of the UK Biobank, I'm sorry, the CEO of UK Biocenter. And he's going to be talking a little bit about different tools that are needed to conduct biomedical research. So in today's panel, we plan to explore how investing in biomedical research has already shaped our society and why these panelists think that an investment in biomedical research is important for the future of all society, where innovation is coming from, how we're going to get to increased innovation and what, what the elements of that are, and then we'll talk about the economics of biomedical research, both from the sense of what it means to individuals, to patients, but also to the economy of different nations and, and individual entities, like uh, companies like Sanofi. So the first question that I want to ask our panelists, and, and then we'll ask each of them to comment on this and, and get a dialogue going on it, and we'll start with the positive, which is, what are you feeling optimistic about today? And what, what's exciting to you about science and medical research? And I'll, I'll turn immediately to my left and have you talk a little bit first. Um, well, I mean, I suppose the first thing is that you stimulated me by saying you come from faster cures, but of course the challenge is preventing disease. And, and that's the real opportunity. And of course it is the public health measures that have made the most difference. So separating the water we drink from the water we excrete is one of the most important things that we can do. Um, yeah, we, <laughs> don't go the whole way, please. Uh, um, but, but in terms of the opportunities, uh, it's the power of information and information technology that is actually transforming our ability. Um, and it's also the ability to do public health population science at a scale we could never do it before. Uh, it's the power of the genome, uh, not, to not only to understand human um, uh, variation in health and disease, but actually to understand the microbial world. So we can track infections, we can diagnose them, we can monitor their resistance and susceptibility to antibiotics. So we are at an incredibly exciting time with the opportunity to have fantastic impacts. But the big I have a perspective, obviously, of having been director of the Wellcome Trust for 10 years and now inside government. And I suppose moving inside government, you really start seeing also the importance of all the things outside health that affect health very directly. So uh, on Friday, we had the summary from policymakers from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, of course, it is the climate, the natural infrastructure in which we live that vitally affects our health. And so... For me, the challenge isn't identifying the important questions, it's actually tackling them and making sure we have the tools to do that. Gary, you have had a uh, long career in science and research. You know, when you were at the NIH, you headed the Vaccine Research Laboratory, and you were really looking at the future of what vaccines might offer society. 
Uh, can you talk about what's, what you're feeling optimistic about, both from your uh, career of research, but then you know the work that you're now leading at Santa Fe, and also uh, if you can, you know, connect it to these comments that we've just heard about um, why it would be better if we could to prevent diseases versus always having to look for the magic bullet, so to speak. Sure, Margaret. Well, it, it's um, preaching to the converted in terms of prevention. My role at the NIH uh, in the Vaccine Research Center was to try to develop an AIDS vaccine. And uh, one of the most challenging scientific, medical, uh, public health, and economic problems, I think, that we face around the world. Um, what I would say is that, um, you know, what, what I find exciting and uh, where I think we're going to have real breakthroughs in, um, in medicine uh, are in the areas where we've, been, where we've made long-term investments in the science. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, on the prevention side, uh, we're not quite there yet, but I think that uh, we are beginning to see the outlines of what I would call a universal flu vaccine. So that would be a vaccine that we could give uh, like we give the measles, mumps, rubella, vaccine during childhood, maybe once every five years, but certainly not every year, and certainly not with the risks of, um, of pandemics coming around the corner that we're unprepared for. Um, <clears throat> still work to be done there. Our scientists at Pasteur at Santa Fe are working on that problem, as are scientists all around the world. Another area that I uh, find very, very exciting uh, on the therapy side uh, is again a result of investment of maybe two or three decades worth of work, and it's in the area of, um, of cancer therapy. And what is beginning to break, and I think we're already seeing the results in small numbers of patients, are some very new approaches to, um, to using the immune system to recognize and kill cancer cells. Uh, there's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Carl June, who literally for more than two decades has been looking at ways to arm T cells. These are the cells that patrol the body looking for cancer cells. Uh, and he does this by, arm, by genetically modifying them, giving them a receptor that will recognize the tumor cell. And they've been uh, now tested in patients with end-stage leukemias and lymphomas uh, that have resisted all types of treatment. They get an infusion of cells, uh, no side effects, and within a week, a very high percentage of these cancer patients are seeing the tumors regress entirely. That's truly exciting, and uh, that's the kind of innovation we're looking for. Now, what we have to understand in terms of making this a scalable treatment that can be delivered to people all around the world is that we have challenges of a different sort because we're very used to making drugs that we can give in a bottle. Now we're talking about a genetic modification. So we have to learn how to commercialize that, how to, how to manufacture it, how do you make it scalable and deliverable to the world. It'll take a few years. But when you see that kind of success and in people who clearly would not have more than a few months to live, that's what gives you some hope. Terrific. Thank you. Roxandra, could you talk about what you're feeling optimistic about and, you know, perhaps give us a glimpse into the um, sort of collaborative framework that I think you're trying to initiate through your work at the European Commission? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more general uh, than Mark and Gary and um, say that I'm very optimistic to see that the new programs that at least we are uh, setting up uh, are very much geared in uh, developing a dialogue uh, between the different stakeholders, being the academic investigators, small enterprises, uh, or the larger industry, um, uh, in order to speed up the drug development processes and capitalizing uh, on the new technologies, uh, on the innovation that, in fact, is bubbling out there, uh, but which faced up to now the famous valley of death. And uh, those partnerships uh, that are built on the, the dialogue uh, on funding that is available uh, for putting forward uh, common projects um, have uh, already uh, gave significant results. I'm, uh, for instance, talking about the Innovative Medicine Initiatives. This is a partnership 
uh, between uh, the union uh, and the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, uh, where uh, this public-private partnership already, uh, in fact, mobilized almost a, a billion euros uh, in projects that address very complex problems that none uh, of the um, industrial partners alone or academic alone or patient organizations, if you wish, uh, have succeeded to um, um, put forward up to now. So. I'm excited that we are going to work on a new taxonomy of disease, so a new classification of diseases uh, on molecular basis, um, that this partnership uh, will allow, um, we've talked about HIV, we do have also public-public partnership uh, with the member states uh, to um, develop uh, and fund clinical trials for HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, neglected infectious diseases. So, um, uh, this idea that the common work uh, can significantly speed up the process and bring these necessary interventions to patients uh, as fast as possible uh, is what makes me very optimistic. Thank you. So, Tim, talk to us a little bit about the work that you're leading at the UK Biocenter and why that work is relevant. Um, and, you know, when we were prepping for this panel, you mentioned about how um, you're getting a pretty high uptake of people who are interested in putting more data into their profiles after they've submitted a sample. I mean, is that a source of optimism for you, <coughs> people's ability to participate? And, and how does that connect to our ability to accelerate research? Well, I think just to clarify, the, 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 the focus for this might, would, would be better on UK Biobank. And I'd like to pick up on a theme that Gary raised, is, is the maturing of long-term investments in science. And that's what's really exciting me with UK Biobank. This was a project that was set up in about 2002 to understand the causes of complex diseases that, that kill and disable so many people in, in middle and old age. And it's uh, uh, over the course of about six or seven years, it recruited half a million people from around the United Kingdom um, who gave us a lot of information about themselves. They gave us some biological samples. But critically, they gave us permission to access their medical records, which means that you can build very, very powerful um, experiments looking at the causes of these diseases. Um, and that is now starting to mature. We're having the first applications to use this resource, and we're starting to see new insights into, into z diseases that wouldn't previously have been uh, attainable. Uh, we've, we're, we're doing some very, very interesting work with two universities in the UK looking at uh, what causes chronic uh, pulmonary disease in people with a history of smoking and people who have never smoked. Um, so, so I think that's incredibly exciting that we're starting to see these long-term investments mature. But actually there's a second phase, and, and, and picking up on something that Roxandra mentioned, the potential of new technology that maybe wouldn't have been uh, thought of when this was first conceived, the power uh, of that in this study. And I'll give you an example. Because the, 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 the UK Biobank a study has been done in a certain way. It's now attracting substantial new funding. And we're in the process of uh, measuring 800,000 points of variation in the genomes of each of these individuals. Um, and, and using some, some sophisticated informatics approaches, we can, we can double that information, essentially. Um, and that will give you insights into genetic risk factors in, in, a, in a number of diseases, because this is a so-called prospective study, in, in a wide range of diseases. Um, and that is just an astonishing achievement to, to have occurred for the cost that it has in the course of 10 years. And then this in itself will form the basis for whole genome sequencing, which will start to occur over the next three to five years. And I heard yesterday about a technology which is proposing that you can do a whole human genome for 500 pounds. So, so the rate of change, which in itself presents some challenges, is, is I think it's just an incredibly exciting time at the moment. So the London Summit is really looking at financial markets, and one of the purposes of this panel is to integrate the idea of medical R&D funding and life science investment into that equation. But the time frame for a payoff from investment looks different in this sector than it might, you know, for the next um, iPhone-type product. Could you talk a little bit, Mark, about the... Um, you know, the government's perspective in the UK on the role of life sciences to the economy. I mean, you've talked about it from the standpoint of the need to prevent disease. We're, we're hearing about the need to find cures and treatments for diseases, you know, where there's unmet need. But 
what's the economic equation here? And then, Gary, I'd love for you to jump in as well and, and the others about, um, you know, your different sectors' perspectives on that. Um, the government is strongly committed to health and health research. And indeed, in uh, December 2011, the Prime Minister announced a life sciences strategy. And a report that subsequently came out was entitled Innovation, Health, and Wealth. And I think, in a nutshell, that captures a lot of the issues, which is, of course, that health underpins wealth, and it's one of the challenges in the developing world. But actually, health is also a significant part of the UK economy and, indeed, the global economy. Um, and, of course, having a very large single-payer system, which is the National Health Service, offers incredible opportunities as well. And so an example of where the government is providing support is that it's committed um, a, a, a 100 million pounds for the sequencing of 100,000 genomes of people within the NHS. Um, and so I don't think there's any sort of conflict between the idea that health research is important primarily because, of course, it delivers better health to all of us, but also it is just an incredibly important part of the UK economy and indeed the economy of many countries around the world. The challenge, of course, is the cost of health. And the community always says, OK, well, if you fund more and more research, it'll get cheaper and cheaper. Um, but of course, that doesn't quite happen. And that's one of the challenges for all health payers, private or public, that actually the costs are high. And what we have to be better at doing is stopping doing things that don't work and making sure that, in fact, that we do use informatics to hold the health systems to account. Uh, so, for example, in Scotland, where they have used a database to collect all of their diabetics, they've been able to drive up the efficacy of testing for the standard things that you know any junior doctor or medical student is taught that you should test for in diabetes, but which nevertheless, um, if you don't have a relentless focus, don't happen. And they've used that to drive down amputations due to vascular disease by about 40% and laser eye surgery. So actually, we have to use information um, in order to actually improve the efficacy of our health care and also in terms of getting access to health care. But the other side, and it's a pity that, that, that Margaret Hamburg isn't here, is that we've actually got to also look at the costs of regulation and make sure that regulation is fit for purpose because, of course, what's happened is, and I'm sure Gary can talk about this, that the costs of developing a new drug have ramped up astronomically. And I think there is a real question as to whether... Um, all of those costs are necessary and whether we can't actually drive some costs out of the system. And again, just be before I pass maybe across to Gar Gary, um, we can use informatics to drive down the costs of studies. And so there was a trial of a statin that was done in Scotland, classical phase three study, cost a fortune. They were then able to use just standard health service informatics to follow up those patients for another 10 years or more after the study, which cost a few thousands of pounds only and show that the drugs were still very effective. So actually, we've got to get better at doing the development of new therapies more cost-effectively. Before we turn the mic over, though, could you elaborate a little bit more on the role that you are playing within you know, UK government to forge that discussion? I mean, that's certainly a discussion that we are having in the United States around cost of regulation, uh, you know, certainly strong funding for science and medical R&D. Uh, and ultimately, will it be reimbursed, and how do you pay for all of it? Um, it sounds like you are threading the needle in, a, in an effective way, or am I giving you compliments that aren't warranted? <laughs> they're, they're maybe a bit premature. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, my job is to advise government on all aspects of science, engineering, technology, and social science as it applies to all aspects of government policy. So it's quite a big area. But then regulation actually runs as a theme throughout that. And I, I'll make a general point about regulation, which I think is important which is, it's about the incentive scheme for the system for regulators, which is that regulators get into trouble if they allow something to happen that causes harm. But they don't get into trouble if they stop something happening that would do good. And so that's a problem of asymmetry. And what we have to do is, I think, look at regulation in all walks of life to try and make sure that the incentives are for regulators to be accountable for all their decisions, both whether they stop something and when they allow it. Because at the moment, there's very little accountability for regulators that stop something happening. So I think that's one of the challenges. But yes, of course, it's a theme of discussion. My job is to advise the policymakers 
it's the job of the people we elect to government to make those policy decisions. Gary? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, along the lines of what you were just talking about, uh, Mark, uh, had the opportunity to actually train in England when I was a medical student, and I saw firsthand what was being done, uh, this was back in the 80s, uh, clinically, and now what is being done uh, as a result of the facilitation from the government here in the UK. And I have to say, in the last few years, it's really been heartening to see uh, how things have turned around, particularly the, uh, I believe it's Dame Sally Davis with the, uh, the uh, NHS and the NIHR, which is a very concerted effort to really drive translational medicine by that, meaning uh, begin to study new therapies in people and begin to make those kinds of initial steps that you were talking about, Mark, to uh, to push us forward into those new areas. That was something that didn't occur until the UK government stepped in and really gave substantial support. So I congratulate you and, and your colleagues on that. In the United States, um, you know, we have relied on a variety of federal agencies, uh, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, there's some other, obviously the Department of HHS. Um, what I would say, though, from my perspective, uh, and particularly as I've moved into pharma, is that the real concerns moving forward are, uh, you know, how do we increase our success rate in bringing new therapies to patients, and how do we improve the pace? And this gets back to the question of creating um, medical value, uh, as well as economic value from what we do in uh, biomedical research. And I think that the, uh, we really are focused on two major strategies. Uh, one is that the pharmaceutical industry can no longer afford to have a very uh, inward-looking view of research. Uh, bio, 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 biological science is way too complicated. It's not like the high-tech industry where you can engineer a new phone in a matter of days or put in new informatic systems that can a leapfrog over existing technologies. This is complex, and it's very data-rich, as Mark pointed out. So what we really have come to do, at least at, at our organization, and I think other pharmas are doing the same, is to have a much more open model of innovation, looking to our collaborators in the academic medical centers, in the biotech industry, in the venture uh, community, and saying, you know, how can we collectively work together where we each bring our strengths uh, to the problem and where we uh, essentially de-risk these large investments. Uh, I saw one slide that said $1 billion for a new drug. I think that number is closer to $5 billion. Uh, so what we can do collectively is essentially uh, increase the likelihood of success by combining and pooling our collective talent. And that open innovation model, I think, is one that is uh, actively in process. The second thing that we can do is the is to uh, get quickly to, uh, in terms of increasing the pace, to, to human trials. Uh, the sooner we can test uh, a candidate uh, vaccine or treatment in people and get a signal that it's actually working, then we can get behind that product and really accelerate our pace going forward. So I think those are the emphases uh, from our side on doing it faster and better. And I completely agree, we have to do better in the future because uh, there's, there's just too much that needs to be done. Well, I, I want to come back to, I mean, to, to, to agree, really. And, and the, the opportunity now is to do things at a scale that could never be done before. And public-private partnership is a very powerful way of doing that. So if you look at the Genome Project, the single nucleotide polymorphism consortium, the SNP consortium, was a very good example of that. And now the Structural Genomics Consortium, where pharma partners can, uh, as it were, say, say which proteins should be crystallized. But at the end of the day, everyone gets the information on the protein crystal structure at exactly the same mom moment. The industry, all the industry competitors, the whole public sector. So there are huge opportunities. Um, and I think the other point about human studies, where I agree with you, is I think the real challenge also is to go on observing in real time once drugs are launched. 
So what we've tended to do is the historical model is that we do these enormous clinical studies and then the drug is out there and we sort of wait for things to happen and I'm caricaturing it slightly. The opportunity now is with informatics that we can go on observing those populations in real time because there's always a big gap between even the best phase three studies which are you know, maybe tens of thousands of patients, you suddenly start discovering new stuff when it gets out into hundreds of thousands or indeed sometimes millions of patients, also in drug combinations and in the real world in ways that didn't happen before. The opportunity now is actually to keep watching. So, you know, I, actually, Mark, you, you, what your comment reminds me of an interesting uh, statement that was said by Maurice Hilleman. Maurice, Maurice Hilleman developed every childhood vaccine that we've ever probably, most of us in this room have had, he was at Merck, and Maurice used to say after he launched a new vaccine, I hold my breath for the first three million doses. <laughs> he feels really safe right now, I bet, right? So, Roxandra, can you talk about this perspective of the economic driver of, you know, medical R&D to economies, but also I think we're starting to hear this consistent theme of the need for collaboration in research which you know, may or may not be true in all other industries that are going to be talked about today at this London summit, but certainly what we're seeing in this space is that there, there is a lot of room for collaboration, particularly in the private sector, in this pre-competitive space, and, and a real necessity for it. So I know that uh, you know, the Innovative Medicines Initiative is doing some of that work. Can you uh, tell a little bit of that, that story in terms of what that process is like and also how do you herd cats in terms of doing it at the European Commission level? Herd cats is one of our most favorite pastimes. Um, so um, uh, to first put it into perspective, we are now uh, working towards the next framework program for research and innovation, which is called Horizon 2020. Uh, it is meant to begin uh, in January of 2014. Um, uh, with uh, a much uh, higher impetus uh, on the innovation component, uh, with special programs um, to attract small and medium enterprises, uh, with a new small and medium enterprise instrument that is very similar to the SBIR instrument uh, in the United States. Um, a certain percent of the budget uh, is, is already earmarked there. Of course, not forgetting the excellent science, but then uh, in um, areas uh, with significant societal impact, uh, putting forward those societal challenges uh, and instead of funding topics, um, put forward problems and then uh, try to um, have portfolio of, of projects that are looking at uh, how those problems can be resolved from multiple perspectives. Uh, in our field, uh, the challenge is called health, demographic change, and well-being. Uh, and for the first two years of the uh, program, we will focus on personalized health and care. Uh, why? Because we've realized, as Mark was pointing out, that some of these very big trials, um, um, maybe the therapies are working in 30 or 40 percent of the patients um, that are enrolled in the trial, and um, uh, developing much more targeted interventions, and we do have a few examples that are ongoing, for instance, um, the National uh, Cancer Screening Program in France, um, uh, where, in fact, screening the patients ahead of starting the therapies creates significant savings. But that is a, a punctual in example. We think that we need to do much more uh, that first uh, to be able to classify the diseases in a way that takes it from phenotypic medicine to molecular medicine uh, and then uh, foster the business models uh, that are going along. And here is the idea of collaboration, maybe less um, high-impact publications out of uh, our programs, uh, but much more um, uh, new, new patents, new jobs, growth, uh, and this collaboration. So to, to come back to the Innovative Medicine Initiative, uh, we do think that uh, the 47 now projects that we have going all the way from a portfolio in, in diabetes to Alzheimer uh, or to the large knowledge management projects uh, are in fact creating the basis um, for these new business models. Uh, and um, what has, uh, I would say, 
um, the process uh, was conducive to, uh, to establishing a dialogue uh, among the, the various stakeholders. In most of these IMI projects, we do have um, at least uh, eight pharmaceutical companies that are working together, pulling their background information and sharing, and I wouldn't call it pre-competitive. I don't think that is the right term. I think that is non-competitive because the companies are deciding uh, where are the areas where they could work together, um, um, share the data with the academic investigators that are also bringing in the project their own data, small enterprises that are very entrepreneurial that can develop these ideas, but not to forget patient organizations. We are talking about new regulation. So in many of the safety projects, we do have the regulators as participants in the projects. So um, um, that platform of dialogue um, that would be conducive to the new business models uh, is I think the biggest achievement. I, I'm not talking about the sci scientific achievements, which each alone um, uh, could be very impressive. I'll give an example where for instance, one of our pr first projects is called New Meds. Um, uh, it is a project looking at stratifying patients uh, with schizophrenia and depression. Data from 67 different clinical trials have been put together for schizophrenia. Um, 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 and uh, in fact, 23,000 patients have been looked upon and stratified. But looking at the entire data, what happened as a byproduct, if you wish, at the time that these people have to be enrolled in clinical trials have been shortened, and the number uh, of individuals that have to be enrolled in each of the arms of the clinical trial has been diminished. So a significant step forward as far as regulation. So if, if we could pull up slide number five, please. And this slide will illustrate, you know, this concept that we were talking about before of the cost, the time, and in some ways, the um, you know challenge that we're facing of how do you get from you know, an idea to an actual product, and so all of these things that you're hearing about up here are potential ways to shave off time or money, um, whether it's collaboration or it's sort of unified investment. Roxandra, if you could share with us what is the budget of the Innovative Medicines Initiative? How much is the European Commission putting into this? Uh, for the first iteration uh, of IMI, uh, the Commission have put 1 billion euros, uh, and that was matched by 1 billion euros of in-kind contribution from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, our proposal for IMI 2, um, that would be part of Horizon 2020, uh, is uh, for each side uh, 1.725 uh, billion euros. So I bring that, that dollar or that pound amount, um, euro amount out for you to, you know, kind of ponder in terms of what we're talking about with the investment here. So, Tim, if you could talk for a moment, if you could bring us back to the, the, the source here, the, the kind of core reason that, that we're having this conversation. Yes, it's about the economy. Yes, it's about jobs and science, uh, but it's really about patients. And can you give us a perspective of how patients are interacting or, or prospective patients are interacting with you at the UK Biobank? Um, I read an article about you when you took the position, you said something about, oh, I'm realizing that I'm actually the target demographic of who we're trying to solicit to, to give samples um, because you are now in that nice middle age category where you know, you're looking ahead at potential different chronic diseases. So what is the uptake like? Because this topic is very critical, as, as you were hearing from Roxandra, getting patients to participate in research um, is really a significant piece of the puzzle. And anything you can do to shave that time off, whether it's samples or clinical trial participation, is relevant and important. Yes, unfortunately, I'm very comfortably in the age range uh, for this study. <clears throat> um, the, 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 we, we, we assessed uh, the reasons why people took part in, in UK Biobank, and it fell into two quite distinct uh, categories. There was the, 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 the type of public-spirited person, the kind of person who gives blood, who was very interested in research, and wanted to, you know, felt they were contributing to, 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 the, to the project. And then, not surprising, there were people who either themselves or a family member or a friend had had a particular disease, so they were very interested in that, in that disease. But what was interesting is we made very clear in the information that was provided to participants that they were unlikely to benefit themselves. In fact, the tagline for the project is benefiting, benefiting the f health of future generations. And, and 500,000 
people were prepared to take part on that basis and give their consent for us to access some, some very, very personal information. I think the, um, the standing of the funding agencies and the standing of the fact that it was integrated with the National Health Service was a major benefit for us. They're very, very trusted um, funding agencies and, and the NHS is, is a trusted and treasured organization in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and actually the response rate was, was you know, very, very good. And, and subsequently, even th th there was an incident, I remember quite clearly, we were about halfway through recruitment and there was an incident that was reported on the news where a disk of personal information had been sent from one government agency to another, unencrypted, and went missing. And I thought, this is really going to impact our, uh, our recruitment here, and it had no effect whatsoever. People were prepared to take part and, and trust, and providing that we, we take the appropriate steps to protect the information, to protect people's privacy, to use the resource and act in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ethical way, um, we'll, we'll continue to retain those recruits. Our, our dropout rate has been very, very small indeed. I'll give away my age. I'm also a participant in Biobank. Um, and actually, the truth is, it's jolly good fun. It, very well organized. Uh, but I may not be the typical subject, because over the years, I've had radio-labeled immune complexes injected into me, bronchoscopies. So I may be a serial participant in medical research. But it is incredibly interesting. But I, I've got a more important point, which is actually... Framingham, for example, is actually framed by the fact that it has been such an important study. Can you, and can you tell just a, a sentence or two about Framingham? In case Framingham is, is, is a small city in the northeast of the States. It's got a population of, uh, well, when it started, it was only five or 6,000 people. Yeah. But from that study, there were a number of hugely important discoveries about links between epidemiological factors, blood pressure and stroke, between lipids and heart disease, all came out of that small study. That was 5,000. Biobank is half a million people. And it's very interesting. If you get people interested in medical research, that's obviously a good thing to do. And I don't know whether Tim wants to comment, but in Bristol, they had a very high recruitment rate. And Bristol was a site where there's a long-standing study going since the early 1990s called ALSPAC, which stands for the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. And, that was a, and, and that's a very popular study in Bristol. And so actually participating in medical research, I think, is helpful in itself. But, but I just want to make a more general point as well, which is that I think that there's a really important point. If we're going to get the maximum impact of health research, it's got to be done in partnership with healthcare systems. And that's where turning to something that Gary said about Sally Davis, the NHS now is structured so that it has these things called academic health sciences centers, a very familiar concept in the United States, and now academic health science networks, where you've got the academic health science centers, typically in the big cities associated with teaching hospitals, at the core of networks that extend out. And I think they're going to be really important, not only as a vehicle for conducting medical research, but also as a vehicle for spreading out best practice. Margaret, may I just come back on that? Just a few points to pick up on Mark's comments. The, the ALSPAC study that he mentioned is absolutely right. The, the actual recruitment rate was highest in Bristol. That was a very, very well-conducted study, and it was almost as if the population had been primed for these kinds of population-based studies. I think the other interesting thing, the, the, the motivations for people to take part in these studies, it, it really was just, just out of altruism. They received no feedback from their visits. They gave up two or three hours of their time and received no feedback from their studies other than their blood pressure might be a bit high. Um, and yet they still took part. And they knew they were not going to receive feedback from subsequent use of the resource. So if, for example, their DNA is analyzed, it, uh, analyzed in two or three years' time and a risk factor is identified, that will not be fed back to the participants. And we assessed people's understanding of, of, of the consent, and they, they properly understood that. And, and, and Mark mentioned Sally Davis there. I think one of the, the areas in general in the UK where we benefit, but certainly within Biobank, is that the, the major funding en, uh, agencies are, are, are joined up and they have common purpose. So you have the major, major funding agencies like the Wellcome Trust to the MRC, and they're very, very well integrated with the NIHR that Mark mentioned to have this, this continuum from basic research through, to, through translational medicine. That is in part down to the relationships between the Lord leaders of those organizations, but it also is clearly a, uh, you know, a, a push from, those, from those, different, th those different organizations, and it makes for a very, very powerful environment for funding. Gary, you wanted to join in? Well, yeah, I just wanted to add two points. I think uh, first on the patient side, um, 
I, I think it, uh, what you're doing in the biobank is fantastic, and I, I think we will see its best days ahead, no doubt. I also want to point out, though, that when we talk about patient-centered uh, solutions and uh, patient-centric efforts, it goes, it can go to uh, many, many levels that can be quite helpful. I think, for example, my experience having worked on AIDS vaccines, we uh, had a lot of interaction with AIDS advocates. And I would have to say that uh, the early years was a little, they were a little bit, the relationships were turbulent. But I'd have to say that after that uh, point, uh, they really became uh, some of our best allies in, in every sense of the word. Uh, I still remember Martin Delaney, uh, who was a Jesuit priest, uh, who led one of the activist organizations in San Francisco. There was no scientific or medical topic that you couldn't talk to about uh, with Martin, where, and he would just have fabulous suggestions, ideas, even about clinical trials or, or bench experiments, anything you could think of, he was there with you and working with you. And I think that as we look out on our patient-centered efforts, that's actually another aspect of what we want to encourage is uh, trying to bring in the thoughts throughout the whole chain, whether that be in early research, clinical translation, post-licensure, they're all important. And that's something that, uh, it, particularly as we develop our models uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, something that, that we pay a lot of attention to. The other thing I wanted to just point out uh, when Mark talked about the academic medical centers is, uh, and I, largely because I think we have many people in this room who have economic interests, is that uh, this it really uh, does generate uh, economic value. Uh, we, we just had our opening in Boston of our new research building at Santa Fe. Uh, the governor of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick, came to that and pointed out some of the value that it's created to the economic growth uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, last year alone, uh, just in the Boston area, biotech pharma generated over 20, 27,000 new jobs. Uh, every major pharma has a presence in the Boston area. Uh, Santa Fe itself went from having 50 employees in 2008 to 5,000 employees. So it really is an engine that can drive local uh, economies, and, and I think we're going to see that uh, increasingly throughout the world. Uh, the, the lesson here, though, is that we have to nurture these ecosystems. Uh, they don't just arise you know, in a desert, uh, the reason Boston or Palo Alto or I think increasingly London and England are moving in the directions that they're moving in is because you provide uh, the funding for strong academic medical centers, because you uh, find ways of bringing pharma, biotech, venture capital all in the same place. and. All of them are important aspects of this ecosystem. We let any one of them drop out, you're going to see failures and you're going to see loss of jobs. So it's something we also have to pay attention to. Well, and just to um, punctuate the point around patient involvement, and so uh, since the commissioner of the FDA is not here, I'll, I'll talk for a second about one of the endeavors that the FDA is taking on, which is looking at the concept of benefit and risk from a patient perspective. And so they have a framework where they will be looking across 20 different disease states. And there was some argument that they should have looked more at disease pathway, but they, they chose some disease states. So I had the opportunity to go to one of those meetings and it was uh, looking at the disease narcolepsy. So there were over a thousand patients who you know, were on, uh, you know, sort of Skyping into the meeting and then probably 500 in the room. Uh, and it was an opportunity for the reviewers at the Food and Drug Administration to hear direct feedback about a patient experience living with narcolepsy and some of the associated conditions, cataplexy, where literally sort of in a moment's notice someone could pass out. So it creates such debilitation that people can't drive, they can't cook. There were children talking about, you know, they can't really go to school. Uh, and to have that face-to-face -face interaction at the reviewer level, I think, was really of critical importance. And I think that it will go beyond, for that reviewer, the opportunity to hear about a narcoleptic patient to 
oh, this is a patient at the end of the road that's waiting for something that I'm in charge of. So it speaks to your point about um, speed of regulation. Roxander, how, how in your work, you know, does, does the patient factor in? So um, uh, we do have patient organizations involvement at every level, but I would like to give a specific uh, example where um, uh, their involvement has been particularly valuable. Um, uh, one of the ideas of speeding up um, uh, drug development uh, and in fact bringing interventions closer to the patients as fast as possible is building international consortia. Uh, and um, we have quite a number that uh, are up and running uh, where the, the union is participating from the epigenome consortium uh, to traumatic brain injury consortium. But uh, the one that actually, in fact, mobilized the most patient organizations in the community uh, is the Rare Disease uh, International Research Consortium. So uh, there, uh, many funding agencies, patient organizations, but also private industry decided to work together for um, something that at the beginning were considered quite unrealistic goals, which is to have a diagnostic for most rare diseases by 2020 uh, and to have 200 new therapies uh, for rare diseases by 2020. So uh, um, counting on the fact that we've started this consortium in 2011, uh, most have said at the beginning that it is going to be completely impossible. But um, the, the patients uh, or the patient organizations who are in fact in this initiative and uh, in the United States is Genetic Alliance and North, uh, in Europe is Eurordis um, and uh, some of the national association like uh, Association Francaise contre la myopathie uh, have I have said no, we will participate. Uh, uh, we are actively involved uh, and we would like to participate in the clinical trials that will be uh, undertaken. Uh, we will do everything for the observational trials, um, give our samples to um, you know, be freely used and so on and so forth. So their involvement has been essential mobilizing the community and as a consequence um, uh, the researchers around have been uh, uh, responding extraordinarily positively so we are uh, already uh, on the way to achieving those very ambitious role, uh, goals and we are only two years within the initiative so we're talking about harmonization both in terms of uh, you know the, the patient voice being brought into the mix uh, in addition to different governments and different sectors mark you wanted to, to jump in on that um, no, I wasn't going to jump in on that point, but let me just take us down a sort of slightly less optimistic view, um, which is that on the plus side, most of the world is actually living longer, uh, and that's a good thing. But there are some huge challenges. So we're facing diseases of aging populations, the challenges of um, diseases that affect cognition, so dementias of various sorts. There's a huge challenge of malnutrition. So there's malnutrition leading to obesity. There's malnutrition leading to starvation to Crashiorca and Erasmus, and then there's the malnutrition of micronutrients, zinc, vitamin A. Huge challenges there. Um, how do we deal with the challenge of obesity in you know, our own populations and indeed around the world? There's the infectious diseases. And I, I was thinking when you were talking about the sort of immune therapies for cancer, the biggest thing we could do for cancer, of course, is stop people smoking. Um, that remains an issue. Food security remains an issue. Water security remains an issue. And how we manage energy in a sustainable world. So I sort of slightly, I'm afraid my mind has sort of slightly drifted okay. away. I mean, I think the patient voice is hugely important. And, you know, when you actually want to know about risk benefit, you're better asking the patient what they think about right. risk benefit than, than, than any of the people that don't have it. Because actually the world looks different when you're the person that's suffering from a disease. But I sort of drifted to the sort of slightly bigger issues, I think. No, being an asthmatic, the uh, smoking issue is, is significant for me, and, and I've noticed a lot more smokers here. Um, so let's end on, unfortunately, more of a, you know, kind of a concern note. So I'd like the panelists to weigh in on this topic of what is it that is making you worried, concerned? What do you think are potential obstacles that we need to deal with? Gary, do you want to go next? Well, you know, I'd say the number one obstacle is uh, is really the solving the, the challenges, the scientific challenges, and uh, being flexible in terms of how we can approach them. Uh, you know, 
one thing you realize when you start to develop new treatments is that there are a thousand ways that they can fail. Uh, sometimes they can be as simple as, you know, getting the wrong packaging for a drug. Um, so uh, I think that what we've really got to do as we move forward is we've got to, uh, as I said earlier, put together the kinds of groups that will help us foresee problems in advance, uh, not let them become issues, deal with the important regulatory concerns, as Mark has pointed out. I should also add, we have the former commissioner of the FDA sitting right over to our right, uh, as, as quiet as a church mouse, uh, but uh, Andy von Eschenbach is, is here uh, today as well. So I think we all really need to pull together. It's, uh, you know, like one of your uh, Oxford crews, we all have our, our oar and we need to put it in the water together. Uh, <laughs> Roxandra. Um, we are funding uh, excellent research and innovation, but m my worry is that uh, many of these interventions will be left on a shelf, even if they are uh, simple uh, and, and very effective. Um, but they are, the road to the healthcare, to the health system, um, is very arduous. And, and sometimes is it inertia? Uh, sometimes it, it is education, including the medical staff education. Um, uh, all those things have to be taken uh, into consideration uh, when um, uh, you know promoting the innovation. And I think that uh, if we could do more uh, for the uptake, uh, and here is where uh, I think that the patient's voice uh, are, are, are extremely useful, um, that uh, would be a positive, but I'm uh, worried that it's not fast enough. Tim. For me, I think it's that the, uh, the IP, the legal, the data privacy, and, and the ethical framework can keep pace with the developments in, in medicinal sciences, and, and, and that we, for various reasons, you know, laws framed in, in good faith are no longer fit for purpose, and the pace of change of those laws is not keeping up with, um, with, with medical science, and, and, and we miss the opportunity to exploit data in healthcare systems for, in, in, in a secure and anonymized way for, for uh, improvements in healthcare. And I draw the example of the, uh, the Swedish national cohort, which, which was a, a large, ambitious cohort of about 500,000 people that got going and then had to be stopped because it bumped into a, 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 a national law around data privacy. And I'm not sure that's actually been resolved yet. It may have been. So I recognize that we have taken you on a very fast and furious ride of some of these issues in this panel. Um, you know, the, the issue of patient engagement and certainly some of the advances that we've seen through investment in science and research um, are brought to bear out of the HIV stories that you raised. Years ago, I did HIV prevention policy, and in a very similar type uh, room setup, we were leading a meeting about changing the disability definition uh, to include some new conditions uh, for HIV so that people who had those conditions would get benefits. And ACT UP came into the meeting and handcuffed themselves to all of our participants. So uh, it was a very, um, you know, sort of fast way of getting everyone's attention to their issues. And I, I hope that this panel has, has for you, um, if you are sort of a layperson to this area, woken you up to the power of this investment and also giving you a sense of what some of the challenges are, some of the things that we need to do globally, and this is not just a country-specific problem, to overcome some of those challenges. So I encourage you to come up for a moment and uh, chat with some of our panelists and continue to keep in touch with us at Faster Cures. We have a variety of social media ways that you can learn about these issues, and uh, we have something called Smart Brief, which gets delivered to your email a couple of times a week. So we thank you all for your participation and thank you to our panelists today.